Rewind the dynamite from the post wrestling site. AEW, lighting up the fuse. Sit back and enjoy the bubbly. As we hear from John and Waiting. Where we're going, we don't need roads. And if the bug stops here, this thing might blow. Everything you hear, opinions of the show. And if you don't like it, go to the forums and let them know. Welcome, everybody, to Rewind to Dynamite. It's John Pollock. And waiting. Hi, boy. Hey, John. How you doing? I'm doing. I'm doing swell. Swell. Okay. I'm it's trying okay. to like. Yeah, I try to. Honestly, it doesn't really matter what word you say. It's more you so. Don't care. No, it's more so the way you say it. You know, the tone in which you say it. Sometimes you could be like, "I'm swell," I'm or great. you could be like, "I'm swell." And I would say that that was more of a six out of ten swell. Well, that's what swell is, isn't it? No, no one is ever like uh, swell is like middle of the road, right? It's I not like so. over the moon, but it's not bad. You'll take yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Swell, swell is more like I think uh, really good if it was like eighteen forty. You know, that's what that's what they would say back then if they really wanted to like like that was the lit back in eighteen eighteen forty. Um, p- uh, possible, possible. This is why our shows go so long. It's uh, it, it are the, it's these deep dives into our hellos. <laughs> yes. What'd you get up to today? Uh, not a whole lot. Yeah. Is that a um, redundant question these days? Uh, it, it's becoming more and more. Unfortunately, yeah. I didn't really go out anywhere other than to uh, pick Pauline up and beyond that, we we did one of those DoorDash. Uh, or sorry, what do you call those? Um, like the food box things. Hmm. So we got one of those and we made a. Um, Meatloaf. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> I watched uh, the uh, last night. I watched the third episode of uh, Wandavision. I thought you were all caught up, but you're only on episode. No, three, no, right? no. I was not. I was not caught up. Oh, I'd okay. watched the first two, mm-hmm. and then I watched the third one. So I'm one behind now. Okay. I'm not in any rush. I'm. I'm. I'm enjoying these episodes. I. I. I, I love the third one. I really like the third episode a lot. This is the uh, the arrival of. Uh, Billy and Tommy. That is correct. Yeah, the twins. Yeah. I, I, well, I think you're going to really enjoy episode four. Like that's, I would say the first three really kind of lay the groundwork for um, a big, I would say, almost like a mid-season finale in episode four. So I think you'll really enjoy that. Uh, so that is what I did. I've also started The Wire as well. Oh, okay. As nice. I mentioned. What do you think? It's pre- it's It's pretty... I'm into it, like, immediately, like, right out of the gate. Uh, this is only season one, so five seasons altogether. But it's all yeah. on Crave, like, the whole thing there. Yeah, everybody recommends it, and um, I've yet to dive in myself. But, uh, John, uh, I hope plenty of people tweet you about it. Oh, that's that's definitely okay. Assume that... I'll, I'll be honest, like, I've... I check my tweets so irregularly now, the odds of me even getting it are slim, so... T- tweet away then. <laughs> Why not? Um, but yes, we have wrestling to talk about tonight, as we do most nights. Uh, but wait, what is going on in the cafe as we speak? Well, right now, we uh, last night we just released uh, Rewind Away, number 79, talking about New Japan Pro Wrestling's G1 Climax 25 Final, a classic match between Shinsuke Nakamura and Hiroshi Tanahashi, uh, which I embarrassingly misspelled. In the show description. I don't know if you caught that or, or... I fixed it today. You fixed it. I know. I spelled it Tahanahashi. Tahanahashi, <laughs> yes. I spelled, sent it out to all the patrons. I didn't even realize it myself, so... Um, Did anyone no, alert you of this? Nobody. Nobody, oh. no. So, Hiroshi Tahanahashi versus um, Shinsuke Nakamura. In the last match that these two have had, this was quite the card uh, to look back on because so many of these people on this show have gone on to... Just completely do uh, so much. And in some cases, so little. We got Ricochet versus uh, Kushida. We've got the Young Bucks versus Red Dragon. And plenty of appearances from uh, a number of other people who are um, in very prominent positions today in pro wrestling. So it was a really interesting show to go back and look look at. Uh, and then coming out 
Friday, of course, we're going to SmackDown. This weekend, we've got our next episode of Rewind Division with me and WH Park talking about episode five. And then the season finale of Total Bellas that Paulie and I will be breaking down on Total Recall. So that'll all be coming out this weekend on the Post Wrestling Cafe. And if you join right now at the beginning of the month, you have access to uh, next Tuesday's Ask Away. You've got access to the live edition of the Wellness Policy, our new uh, New Japan New Beginning Post show is going to be coming out next week as well. Another right away, Rocky Balboa. Uh, just a whole lot of stuff. And if you're a double double patron, the chance to catch Rewind Raw and Rewind Dynamite live in addition to everything else. So, uh, best value for, for your money to sign up right now at postwrestlingcafe.com. Yes. And we're uh, hitting you over the head now because if you sign up at the beginning of the month, it gives you the most value. If you want to say the night of elimination chamber, you suddenly want to have that impulse subscription well it's already three weeks into the month you might as well just sign up now and then get all of the stuff all month long it's going to be the exact same amount so we're trying to give you the most value imaginable we're talking about a month that's only 28 days so hurry up what are you waiting for yeah we care about you (laughs) yes absolutely yes um yeah you know uh i i realized listening to some of your recent shows, you've got to be like the birthing expert now between all different like galaxies and through different uh, human form. You've got to witness the arrival of four babies over the course of two podcasts that you did. It was weird. Like in one weekend, I, I did two shows about like two births. I mean, in all very different forms. First of all, of course, we're talking about WandaVision and I guess uh, the Scarlet Witch just kind of conjuring up these these little twin babies from out of nowhere, and then um, and then a natural birth from Nikki Bella, and then a C section birth from Bree. So uh, all all forms of uh, you know life's greatest miracle I I covered over the past month. So is it is it one episode you have to review of uh, Total Bellas? Is that all that's left, or are there two? Yeah, it's only one. Yeah. Okay. So this is it. The, the season's over. This is the season finale of. Total Recall. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Well, check out that uh, on Sunday. Well, let's uh, move on over to some news coming out of uh, the past couple of days. I want to start with this story uh, because on Tuesday, it was uh, reported by PW Insider that Lars Sullivan no longer with WWE. He was quietly let go and it wasn't reported until Tuesday. And then uh, today, uh, Fightful spoke with Lars Sullivan and they reported that he had told WWE that he was done wrestling due to extreme anxiety issues that he has been uh, having that have affected his eating, his sleeping, and I guess got the release. And he told Fightful that he is likely done with wrestling and did bring up, uh, not going into specifics, but uh, past actions that he has certainly been been tied to and have been very public, uh, calling these actions idiotic and his own selfish behavior, uh, but also reiterated to the site that he was treated well by both the WWE office and by the locker room. And of course, when he did have the main roster call up in 2019, this was before that knee injury that took him out. Uh, That's when all of the message board posts resurfaced once again, and it led to the WWE announcing they were fining him $100,000 at the time. And then he had the knee injury and he was out for a long time and had just come back right around the draft last year and was getting featured on SmackDown and then again just disappeared. And it looks like he will not be back. Mm hmm. Yeah. um, I think a lot to say about this man's run and, um, you know, from what's come out about this man's character. Um, I've seen a lot of debate today about, you know, why WWE didn't just release him sooner. I, I don't really know where, where I fall on all that because, um, I think there's, you know, a very, you know, serious, like mental health issue at play here, but with the guy that I feel like they're probably, they're probably very conscious and careful with, um, you know, what this man's past actions, like it's, it's pretty, it's all out there. Some of it is, um, pretty deplorable others you know not not really something i would i feel like you should you could you should punish him for but um 
Yeah. Um, it, at the end of the day, I, I mean, this, you know, whatever run this guy had, um, there were kind of one too many, like major issues that really seemed to prevent, prevent things from happening. So, um, this, this just appears to be the end result for the time being. Yeah. And I mean, if, you know, if it was his call here, like it did seem like the company was very invested in him on multiple occasions, like the first call up and then coming back, like he was positioned on SmackDown that he was going to be the, have the big monster role on SmackDown. It was very short lived. And it's interesting to hear the discussion about like this anxiety issue, because I, I don't know if it's to the same extent, but it's just over the past a uh, couple of days, I saw the day of special that they did for the Royal Rumble 2014. And it was like Dave Batista is very like, this is a guy that like goes through some significant anxiety. You can see like the day of a show and he's kind of explaining it to him, like just how much pressure he puts on to himself to the point that it's like, it seems like it's a really, a real burden on him. And granted this was seven years ago. Uh, but then you had, there was this interview they did with Victoria right after the rumble and she was talking about the fact that she is one of the worst people when it comes to nerves to the point like she's vomiting before she has to go out and just uh, an extreme amount of pressure that some of these performers, regardless of how how like veteran status or not, that that's 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 a thing. And I, I would wonder how how widespread that is for, for some performers of dealing with that, uh, that uh, that anxiety that. You know, in the case case of Lars Sullivan here is something that, you know, he ultimately feels that like he's probably walking away from the industry over. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure like some level of stage fright is very normal. But at what point does that, you know, escalate to something that's abnormal and preventing you from being able to live a normal life? I don't know. We we don't some of these backstories. I don't know if we'll ever really find out in, you know, a case like Lars Sullivan's. But, um, uh, you know, that seemed to be his his answer in today's interview. The raw number on Monday, uh, they did a million eight hundred and ninety-two thousand viewers. So, I mean, the main focus we can talk about is the third hour. So, I would say the number as a whole, I, especially for the day after the Rumble and it being Edge's first match on Raw in a decade, I would say the number overall, it, I, I don't think it was anything great. The third hour, though, it, if you're if you're looking at it for, during the Thunderdome era, this was their third best hour three that they've had since August. So that part was good. Uh, several different demos were up in the third hour. So that that's always a positive sign because that doesn't happen with any kind of regularity. Uh, they were the top show on cable and uh, they were up in the demo figure. Uh, but what was really staggering way was looking at last year's raw after the rumble. And this year they're down 21% in viewership, 24% in their 18 to 49 number and down 33% in their 18 to 34 number that's in one year um so that was the raw number um so basically this was not at the level of legends night a few weeks ago and in the demo figure it was only their third best number this year so of five episodes it was number three so i wouldn't look at this as like they got a gigantic jump that you would expect coming off your number two number three pay-per-view of the year and the the third hour though i mean it did better than a lot of third hours so there, there's that i would certainly expect so, so i think with you know a pretty pretty big match that you could have saved for pay-per-view i personally feel like they should have at least given this a week you know to really kind of let it simmer and let the audience anticipate it so that next week you might even get a i think this week coming off of the rumble you probably would have done a pretty decent number anyway but they're just don't, don't like, you think it would have been better though i i, th- I think like AEW could have learned something here i mean they made the cardinal sin they announced Shaq was wrestling over a month in advance. And I think that was a big blunder. Like I want to tune into dynamite, maybe segment two, at least segment three, you announced that later on tonight, Shaq's going to wrestle. I think, I think that's what you want to go for. Yeah. We have, we have polar opposites when it comes to long-term promotion between these two. Could you imagine just a week in advance of announcing edge wrestling versus, uh, we set that up in the first hour. Yeah, I never like that. I never think it's it's a good idea to just kind of throw a big match out there with, you know, two hours notice. Honestly, like, I feel like you can make 
you can add interest to any match by like giving it a bit of time and giving it a bit of story. And, you know, in the case of a pretty big match that already exists in Edge and Orton, you could absolutely have amplified, I think, the value. Like last time these guys wrestled, it was the greatest match of all time. Will they be able yeah, to Yeah, what was Monday? It? Was Monday the second greatest match of all time? What, what could they have called it? <laughs> Top 10. Yeah. On a serious note, if you are Christine Lebrano, who is coming in and is specifically tasked with long-term stories, and you're looking at these numbers and where you are year over year, does that not kind of embolden that position of, hey, we need to be able to see and map out where we're going three months from now, a year from now, six months from now, like not to, not have everything set in stone, but have loose ideas and at least have mapped out a week or two of television. This is a woman who's coming from a world where you have your season charted out. I think the bare minimum here is we can look ahead that, okay, our next pay-per-view is February 21st. What are the ensuing raws going to consist of that get us to February 21st? It's hard for me to think what other task somebody of her position would be in charge of other than, you know, big picture stuff. Like, isn't that not the title? Like, is that not a part of this this actual job? So, uh, but we're talking about, you know, a product that I think um, big picture, it means very different in, in a pro wrestling sense than it would, for instance, even something like Portlandia. So I don't really know what much about her background in pro wrestling. Wrestling is a completely different animal than any sort of scripted programming. So we'll have to see how she navigates it. But obviously the hope would be, yeah, better long form storytelling. But that might not mean, like, again, it, it's ultimately like we talked about down to the, to the guy in charge at top and how, how often he might want to change an idea or book a match at the last minute. Um, Raw also did uh, 292,500 viewers in Canada on Monday night. Impact on Tuesday did 173,000 viewers, a small decline from last week, but equal in their demo with a 0. .05. And our last two stories, Way, they're MMA stories, but they're for you. Actually, the first one, uh, we have the Love update. It. Floyd Mayweather Jr., Logan Paul, February 20th. It has been postponed. I know you're very disappointed about this. Did you end up being one of the early birds to buy this for the discounted price <laughs> way back in November? No. Um, shit. Missed it. Well, when, when was it delayed and, and why, why did they delay it? So it's been delayed. No new date has been announced. Uh, but Fan Mio, which is the group that... Uh, is promoting this fight. Their CEO told ESPN that they're hoping to announce a new date soon, along with some exciting new details, following a, quote, absolutely tremendous response to the fight announcement. So does that all add up? Not exactly. Uh, but uh, Logan Paul said that they had record-setting response uh, to, to, to this fight in advance. So... We will see if this fight happens or not, but it has been postponed. There was basically no promotion for this as we were just three weeks out from this. Um, I think there's a much better chance of Jake Paul fighting Ben Askren, but we'll see if this ultimately happens. When are we going to get the brothers fighting each other? That's down the roadway. I'm sure, I'm sure they have long-term booking planned. I'm sure they do. Sure. And our last story, the fate of one Tito Ortiz, city councilor of Huntington Beach, California. So on Monday, he was able to avoid a vote being held, a vote of no confidence that would have removed his title of mayor pro tem, where he is responsible for filling in if the mayor, Kim Carr, is unavailable, as well as being tasked with running council meetings. And Tito Ortiz, dude, they had constituents call in. This whole video is up. It's like six and a half hours. Three hours of it are constituents the vast majority just saying how Tito's got to go. They were not happy with his action so far. Very few supporters for one Tito Ortiz. And at the end, Tito, he's just on this Zoom call for like six and a half hours. Just looks like he wants to be anywhere but there. And he was very contrite. He said, I want to thank each and every one of you. Uh, I apologize if I let anybody down. I think I just let myself down because I went on defensive mode from the very beginning. And I shouldn't have done that. I will work harder and I will try not to miss meetings as hard as I possibly can. I do have other jobs to pay my bills, but at the same time, I will do the best job that I know to do. And Mayor Kim Carr responded, 
I'm asking you to understand and truly be that leader, Tito. I always have an open door. You know that. I don't have an axe to grind with you. Never have. I've never attacked you. None of us have. We're not interested in that. We truly want to do just what it is. Good work for the city. Here's your opportunity. Show us what you can do. Show us that you're in it to win it and that you want to work with us. You want to be a partner and that I know I can count on you because there's going to be that day I need you. And I want you to be there. So you told me I'm in it. I will trust you and I have your back, but I cannot have you lying. That is the biggest thing. You cannot lie to our community. You cannot tell half truths. You have to be completely honest and transparent. Wow. Way you could Um. not pay me enough to move to Huntington Beach, California, but I will greatly observe from afar in a country far, far away. It sounds like, you know, we're in the early stages of like a really big saga. So uh, I look forward to the next chapter. Thank you for all that, John. There you go. Tito Ortiz, uh, city councilor and mayor pro tem. Sounds like, honestly, it's like a, like this sounds like it's a sitcom. <laughs> Former MMA fighter, like runs for office, misses a meeting, has to apologize. Shares conspiracy theories online, refuses to wear a mask. Yeah. It yeah. Goes from a, it goes from like a comedy to like a, a dramedy on like HBO or something. Mm. Very quick. Well, tonight's show was a, a mixture of all those themes and more with Beach Break as we were live from Daly's Place. And starting off the show, it's our 10-man tag team battle royal. And earlier in the day, they announced FTR is out of the battle royal for their, their heinous actions of cutting off a man's horns last week. And FTR was replaced by Alex Silver or John Silver and Alex Reynolds. Was it just 10 men here? No, 10 teams, 20 10 men. 10 teams. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, so we had 19 eliminations in about 11 minutes. So it was a lot here. We had the Young Bucks, Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy, Silver and Reynolds, Private Party, Uno and Silver, The Acclaimed, Jericho and MJF, Santana and Ortiz, Hager and Guevara, and Top Flight making up the teams. And the return of my favorite non-wrestler thus far in 2021, Sammy Hager. Oh, man, this was great. He just sent in, sent in another video, and it was like... <laughs> He doesn't know what's going on. Like, he thought they were going for the tag titles. It's like, go, go get him. This guy's great. I, I hope he's, he's there every week. I hope he, he's just a part of, like, their entrances for any of their big matches. And you're right. Like, I really do wonder how much Sammy Hagar even has, has even seen of Dynamite. Um, it might just be, like, Jericho telling, sending him a text and being like, <laughs> shoot it, do a message. Do a message. It's awesome. It's like like a little great little ongoing gag. Um, and the fact that they can get this, you know, consistently now just really adds to the entire package. It's their entrance theme. Uh, the acclaimed interrupted the inner circle's entrance with Matt Caster, Max Caster doing a rap. And then they showed highlights of the Young Bucks winning the same battle royal a year ago, which got them the shot at Revolution. So the Bucks came out with the titles and then they dove off the stage and were instantly into the action. One part, th- this was really frustrating. Everyone's in the ring and Isaiah Cassidy climbs to the top and he's going to do a big splash. So he jumps off the turnbuckle and the camera cuts away. So you miss the impact. And the joke was he missed everybody in sight and just uh, belly flopped on the canvas. But we did, they had to show a replay of this, but what a terrible cutaway. He missed everything, including the camera. The camera like missed worse than him. Yeah. Dante Martin is the first one thrown out, and this is where they explain both men have to be eliminated. So just because you're out doesn't mean your partner's out. So that meant a lot of eliminations in this, and I'm not going to go through all of them because, as I mentioned, there are 19 of them en route to our finish here. But uh, some of the highlights, we saw Darius stop a silly string, knocking Mark Quinn out. Uh, John Silver got to power up and eliminate several people, including working with Uno to eliminate Luchasaurus. But then he got dumped out when Santana and Ortiz lifted him. Uh, Maybe the most uneventful elimination of a key person was Matt Jackson, who just nonchalantly got back body dropped. And he was gone within two or three minutes of this thing starting. And it wasn't a big elimination. It wasn't, it was almost like the announcers were shocked that he was out so early because Matt Jackson was gone very early and it was just all Nick. I didn't even notice that he was gone. Like, Nick was doing all the spots, and I thought, oh, okay, they've still got Matt in there, right? And then um, I realized he was already out. 
it was really early and just seemed very strange that he was gone so so quick. Um, the Good Brothers appeared and they distract Nick and they pull the rope down, forcing Cassidy to fall over. And Nick is upset and MJF comes from behind and eliminates Nick Jackson. So the final set of numbers, we've got Jericho and MJF the, uh, together. Guevara is on his own. Darius Martin's on his own. Jungle Boy's by himself. And Max Caster. That is your final six. And Jungle Boy gets thrown out by MJF. Guevara goes to super kick MJF, but he misses and hits Max Caster. Guevara and MJF were constantly at odds during the match. Dante then eliminates Caster. And it's down to Dante, Jericho, and Guevara. And Jericho tries to j- to dump Dante over, but in doing so, he knocks Sammy over. So Sammy's eliminated. Dante is on the apron, and he goes for a springboard, is met with the Judas effect, and is eliminated. So Jericho wins, and therefore Jericho and MJF will challenge the Young Bucks March 7th at Revolution. I thought it was a pretty good little battle royal. You know, there's a, a lot of action throughout it, and overall pretty organized and pretty easy to follow with like really just kind of one thing to focus in the ring at the at a time i thought it successfully broke off several stories here and the good brothers teasing that private party match and also teasing you know this ongoing rift between them and the bucks i thought there were some good standout focus spots given to luchasaurus and darius martin being one of the the final two here and john silver so um you know continued at least you know, they're doing a great job of telling you that top flight is, you know, are, are people to pay attention to. And I think somebody like uh, Darius Martin handled the pressure of like being in there for, and being um, in such a spotlighted role really well. And of course, you know, everything that they were doing to continue Sammy's descent between Jericho and MJF, I thought was pretty well executed. Yes. Yeah, I think I said Dante made it today and it, w- it was Darius. Dante was the one that was out uh, right near the beginning. So yeah, Jericho and MJF against the Young Bucks. Do you like that pairing for the pay-per-view? I do. I mean, it's, you know, they're probably the biggest names that you can have. Um, and it seems, you know, probably it's, it's, it's probably a guaranteed win for the Bucks, but probably another way. Well, you know, it's not a guarantee, actually. Uh, I would actually, you know, I think it is. a. I think the Bucks will retain, but uh, it's a, it's a higher profile match for sure. Yeah. There were a lot of bodies to follow, but I did think they they tried to isolate like a couple to put your focus on and a lot of eliminations to go through in in that period of time. But it never to me got to be too chaotic. And I think by the end you had I I think you had like some some interest, uh, an interesting structuring of it. I, I generally do prefer the both guys have to be eliminated rather than ones out. It was it allowed you to do some big eliminations, but still keep the team alive for the end and what different pairings there would be towards the end you and you, you got per, you prefer both guys you mean you prefer one person being the, the way they did it here oh okay yeah yeah, yeah. right as, as opposed to one guy's mm-hmm. out and then both teams are, are gone as well i think you can play with yeah, it a bit too. more by doing it this way mm-hmm. and sammy guevara stormed off to the back after frustrated at jericho and being eliminated in the fashion that he was jade cargill uh was uh the subject of this Video lifting weights. This looked like an ad for Bowflex, complete with a logo at the end. Uh, yeah, or Peloton, or you know any of these other things. Very nicely produced, and I think you know we've seen her promo. I think she's a pretty decent promo personally, but like her most standout feature, of course, is her really impressive physique. And this was you know like a workout video, basically to showcase that aspect about her. It's the thing that really makes her exceptional. Uh, a video like this to me is like very long overdue for Jade Cargill and it makes you wonder the reason why they might have waited this long and I can only think it's because they couldn't pin down a proper date with Shaq until now. In hindsight, I I mean, they probably would have been better off waiting until maybe last month or this month to start the program with Cody rather than having so much downtime between, you know, Shaq's announcement to Jade Cargill's appearance, really kind of like stifling the momentum, I would say, up until this point, but all will be forgotten if this program turns out pretty well. And it really just kind of starts right now. So it's a big role for Jade Cargill. I would uh, give in the ultimatum to Shaq. It's like, you pin down a date or else we're going to just get Barkley for this. Oh, man. Um, maybe that's the follow-up program. Tony Schiavone brought out Sting and Darby for our, our weekly chat with father and son. Tony announces that next week, Darby Allen is defending the TNT title against Joey Janela. 
Taz interrupts. They're banned from the building for attacking the merchandise guys last week. And they're going to be watching Allen's title match next week. Starks doesn't think that Sting is the icon anymore. And they're going to get hurt fighting in the jungle. Sting assures everyone that he's going to be here next week to make sure it's one-on-one between Allen and Janela. And he tells Starks, if you don't think I'm the same guy or the icon, you better take a closer look. End scene. Yeah, it just kind of ends. The hoodlum. Yeah. You know, I I felt really bad uh, for Team Taz here because uh, obviously they weren't even allowed to go back into the arena to grab their bags because you had poor Brian Cage here. His shirt was confiscated. The man standing out in this cold weather without a shirt. Um, I think this feud is kind of cooling off for me. You know, each week they come out here, Darby and Sting, and they just proceed to not really say a whole lot. They kind of spend more time walking than really delivering any sort of substantial story. And it's not like I really need them to get physical or anything like that, but I do think they need to vary up these segments from something a bit more than just coming out here with Tony, getting interrupted by Team Taz, and then like some sort of one-line response. It's getting to the point where I'm definitely no longer really excited to see you know, them promote a Sting appearance. Sting is about to talk. I, I don't like, think they even promoted him this week. I don't think they even, uh, unless it was like a graphic they put out late in the day, I saw nothing this week even mentioning like a Sting appearance that they have done for all the others. Well, I, I guess bottom line is like, I don't really get excited to, you know, see Sting anymore because these things have been pretty kind of, uh you know, uns- unsubstantial and um, might even be getting to the point where I'm starting to groan a little because each time they come out, I, I just end up a little disappointed. Yeah, I mean, there wasn't a whole lot here beyond just the announcement of Darby and Janela for next week. And I, I even got to say, like, my weekly fix of, like, the Taz promo was kept very short here. He didn't even get a chance to get too angry. No, he didn't flip any tables. No karaoke, nothing. Dr. Britt Baker against Thunder Rosa. This has been built up for a long time. And initially, Thunder Rosa goes after Rebel And from behind, Baker grabs her and immediately goes for the lockjaw, and it gets avoided. Rosa threatens with the Fujiwara armbar, and then Rosa misses her in the corner, and Baker wraps the arm around the post, and uh, Baker later gets driven into the apron from the floor, then into the guardrail. They continue fighting. There's an air raid crash by Baker for a two count, and then she places the glove on. She goes for the lockjaw setup, but Thunder Rosa gets to the rope, and... From there, the goes for a crucifix and struggles to apply the lockjaw. Thunder Rosa keeps countering and hits a back suplex, a Death Valley driver. And then it, she applies the Fujiwara armbar. Rebel runs into the ring and does the Toriyano spot where she just tears off the turnbuckle padding. And Thunder Rosa relinquishes the armbar to go after Rebel. And this allows Baker to... Uh, get control of Thunder Rosa, who misses her in the corner and then gets driven into the exposed buckle. Now, the problem here is that the camera was right at the the buckle, like right there. So you got to see her not really make any connection to this exposed buckle. But nonetheless, the lockjaw is applied and she's unconscious. So the referee calls for the stoppage and Britt Baker is your winner. I thought a good match. You know, uh, my hype for this wasn't really there. I honestly didn't even remember this match being on this show until it actually started. But I thought, like, in execution, they delivered as if it came from a pretty long-heated rivalry. It was very intense, constantly active. I thought the moves looked good. Uh, I thought Baker looked very technically fluid. And it was not sort of like an epic level of match, but I thought it felt appropriate for a first chapter, which the finish, you know, you could easily see them doing a, a rematch at some point. So at the moment, I would say this definitely feels like maybe B-level feud, maybe even C-level, depending on you know who you ask. But I think it personally has the potential to headline a Dynamite at least or maybe be a semi-main for a pay-per-view. So I hope in a rematch, they can heat this thing up even you know more than they have. Are you saying the setup for the match uh, next time it deserves its own segment? Or do you oh, mix man. it in with a waiting room segment? Um... I would hope that it gets its own and uh, yeah, it's better than the last one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I thought like certainly the effort was, was, was there. I thought some of the, some of the near falls, they were, they were really building up the match. Um, You know, the finish was kind of your, 
you're out to beat Thunder Rosa and try to maintain something for her coming out of this. So I imagine they revisit this at some point, but uh, good match be- between them. And I guess with, with Britt Baker now, the transition seems like the entire focus of the women's division will be this title eliminator tournament uh, that we'll get to with the announcement of the participants. Which they'll both be in. They were are both going to be in, yes. Yeah. Shivani is with Matt Hardy and Hangman Page. This was from last week where Page took him up on his offer and changed in his dressing room. Hardy has known him a long time. They're both from North Carolina. Page says, I'm not trying to form a team with you or sign one of your carny contracts. Hardy just says, I'm worried about you. And he's so upset that Luther and Serpentico wrecked Minus One's birthday. And maybe we should just team up just one time to make things right with the Dark Order. So Page agrees to team up with him this week. And they would take on Luther and Serpentico in a short match where uh, Luther uh, got to display uh, an avalanche spot onto Serpentico into Hardy and then missed a cannonball off the apron. A lot of this was just Paige just getting to run wild on Serpentico with a spine buster. And then after the cannonballs missed, Paige leaps into the buckshot lariat and then Hardy tags himself in, stealing the pin at 357 just like he did with Private Party. Just a quick little match to kickstart this new program for both of these these guys in, in Paige and Hardy, and uh, really just kind of an excuse for Paige to look really good so Matt Hardy can steal the pin. I'm I'm interested to see like what sort of you know comedic chemistry Matt Hardy and Paige has has uh, together with Paige kind of playing the straight man. Part of me kind of feels like Paige at this point should be fighting for like a, the world title. And instead of like sticking around in these sort of like mid card feuds, but something tells me they're just kind of keeping him warm right now before perhaps escalating him, you know, for a bigger run later this year. Yeah, I, I don't sense anything right now with Paige and Hardy. I don't know. It just hasn't struck me in any way. It kind of just feels to your point, like a bit of a holdover and a, and a little complicated where Matt Hardy is like, it's almost like the private party stuff is now on pause here. It's more, that's a program on impact and then Hardy's working with Paige here. It it just seems like a lot of different things they're trying to throw against the wall to see if something sticks for Matt Hardy. I think, I mean, I can buy that he's he's a guy trying to expand his stable. He's trying to expand his business. So, yes, he has private party, but he's already secured that contract. He might want to try to get another one now. Which is the storyline we just did with Paige. Kind of, yes. Well, everybody's after him. He's a hot free agent. The Women's Eliminator Tournament, it will start this month uh, with matches from the U.S. and Japan. The Japanese bracket will consist of Aja Kong, Yuka Sakazaki, Veni, Emi Sakura, uh, Ryo Mizunami, who is uh, a freelancer who's been doing spots now with uh, with Seed Ring, Mia Saruga from uh, Gato Move, who is trained by Emi Sakura, Rin Katakura from the Marvelous Promotion and Maki Ito from Tokyo Joshi Pro. So those are the eight on that side. And then on the U.S. side, you've got Serena Deeb, Riho, Britt Baker, Ty Conti, Thunder Rosa, Nyla Rose, Anna Jay, and Layla Hirsch. I think a really solid looking lineup. You know, when they when they showed the, this graphic initially and you saw the American flag and the Japanese flag, I wasn't exactly sure what, what it would mean, but it's exactly, I think, what most of us assumed. They're gonna, you're going to have an American bracket and a Japanese bracket. So I'm really, really excited to see a lot of this Japanese talent, especially Maki Ito, who I follow on Twitter, but I've never seen wrestle. Uh, she has my favorite wrestling account other than RJ City. And uh, I think it'll inject a great deal of... Um, you know, she's like a talent. notable like pop star in Japan, like much more popular than just uh, wrestling. Well, wonderful. That's that's great. Like I I I think it'll maybe greatly elevate perhaps um you know the women's division. I suppose if you, you want to consider that uh, of of AEW Dynamite, and um, so they're gonna film those matches there and just like air them on tape. I really? hope th- I hope they do them in like the little like the the gato move like <laughs> in the little like rooms where it's like twelve people watching. They are on TNT. I mean, do they have much of an option? I don't know where they'll film these, but um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. It at least seems definitely more high profile than their women's tag tournament. I mean, you've got all your you've got Baker and Nyla Rose. Uh, a lot sorry, of these and- could also air online too. I don't know. I don't think we're going to see all these matches on on Dynamite. Hmm. Yeah. 
So anyway, uh, they didn't say when the matches will start other than this month. So that is the the 16-woman tournament uh, scheduled. Um, From there, uh, Alex Marvez was with Jericho and MJF. MJF insulted him. They went into the inner circle locker room to celebrate. And Guevara asks, did we do it? As he looks at Jericho and asks, why are we always the collateral damage? And he's not sure if, if they're all in this together. And again, Guevara storms off and Jericho goes over to check on him, leaving the room. And MJF says, it's time for us to have a conversation to the other inner circle members as Wardlow kicks the cameraman out. I think the story is progressing at a pretty good pace here. And, um, you know, we perhaps talk about some of the feuds that have taken place in AEW where every week they do something, but it doesn't really feel like it's moving or we might not even see them every single week. Like the inner circle are, are, are cast members that we see every single week. And I can tell you that I almost never feel like there's any repetition or pointlessness in their segments. They're able to like do slow burns really well. And I think the Sammy, Sammy Guevara, you know, uh, MJF thing is, is a great example of that. I'm, I'm definitely engaged. Perfect segue. <laughs> Because now it is time for the wedding ceremony. Jim Ross says that wrestling weddings are the best. Tony Schiavone interviews Kip Sabian, who's with Miro and Charles the Butler. And he's telling Tony how lucky he is to have this exclusive interview. Vicky comes in telling Kip it's time. And they make a joke about Chuck never having a girlfriend. Mistake number one for this wedding. They got Father Jim Mitchell as the officiant. The last time this guy was in the ring for a wedding, the groom got shot. Worst uh, angle of 2020. Maybe he comes at a good rate. I guess so. Jerry Lynn uh, walked the bride down the aisle, and they share their personal vows, which include Kip saying that from the first time he saw her in that one piece with those knee-high boots, and your eyes met my eyes meeting your chest he knew it was meant to be. You're beautiful on the inside, and damn, you're hot on the outside. Ford goes to give her vows, saying that Kip has the biggest, and she gets cut off, and Kip says, you don't have to share that with everyone, and he finishes the vows for her. We go through the I do's. Jim Mitchell asks if anyone objects, and Miro cuts in, saying, I've been through this. We're skipping this. We're not doing this part. And they are declared husband and wife. Miro then goes to give a toast, and he asks, in the words of Hathaway, what is love? Which led to the crowd singing after. He says he didn't deliver a great bachelor party, but I am the present. My power and viciousness is your present. And then he sees this large gift, and he asks, what is that? And he tackles it, but it's an empty box. At this point, the crowd is singing the Hathaway song. Miro joins in and says, let's get some cake. When all of a sudden he realizes he has been chained to the bottom rope. Chuck then punches Kip, who knocks into Penelope Ford, who falls into the cake. Kip then misses Chuck and hits Miro. And then Kip beats down Chuck. Orange Cassidy pops out from the cake and delivers the beach break onto Kip Sabian. It was months of buildup for this wedding. <laughs> months where we got a beach break delivered to Kip Sabian. I break. don't know what this was. It was a wedding, John. This was not was a, a good wedding. It was a wrestling wedding. Um, no, wrestling wh- weddings are more hit, hits than misses. I thought this one was a miss. Are they more hits and misses? Um, I think lately. they're at least... Uh, at least I'm not saying they have 100%, but they at least have more angles attached to them than this did. Like, what was this? What does this come out of? We're right. We're exactly on the same track that we were before. For an uh, an angle that's been, you know, set up for such a long time, um, I, I definitely think you can look at this one as a disappointment. I do like that they tried to play with our expectations of, of what, a you know, a lot of standard wrestling wedding cliches are. Um the big shackle reveal and the attack, I think, could have been shot a little bit better. I think it could have been better paced for emphasis. 
in execution and almost felt like things happened a little too quickly, kind of without the proper camera angle. So I don't think the reaction at home nor even in attendance was probably as big as intended. And the rest of it just kind of came across as a pretty standard wrestling wedding. You know, a uh, guy pops out of the cake and they have a big fight. And that's kind of it. You know, a bride, of course, gets her face shoved into the cake. And beyond that, um, certainly I think like seeing AEW's take on so many like standard wrestling cliches, wrestling ty- uh, gimmick types and doing a great job of it. Um, this one you can definitely look at as maybe a creative disappointment as most of this feud has been. I mean, what the hell has this whole Butler thing been for Chuck? He's what free. Kind of crea- He's free now. Yeah. Like, what kind of creativity have we seen attached Nothing. to this Butler thing? It's like that it's was been- done for almost no reason. Yeah. Just so like you weren't, so- you weren't rooting for Chuck's freedom. It was like, okay, he did this for two weeks. He hasn't been in all like what, what, what's he been subjected to? He wasn't even on last week. And he had to tell yeah. Orange, uh, my new best friend is Miro. That's what he's been put through. Yeah, like I, I, it almost feels like the whole thing was done so that Chuck could somehow get here to be at the wedding so that he could tie Miro up. And I think Chuck really got the uh, pretty bad end of that deal. Because um, Orange Cassidy could have hit in that. Anyway, I, the, the logic here is not really doesn't really matter it what matters is entertainment value and creativity. that's what i was looking for here like i i didn't think they hit on a whole lot here like yeah they mm. got cute with like the tropes of wrestling weddings i will say that now watching the impact one and this i think wrestling weddings are they really miss something when you don't have real fans in an arena to react to stuff and have that that environment i think it it's really it was even here like it just felt very empty the jokes don't land as easily you did have the hadaway moment which i thought was the best part of this entire thing but i think that would have been so much more amplified if you had that oh no doubt inside like i I think that would have been a cooler moment instead it was almost like this it, it almost took you a minute just to hear what the crowd was saying uh at the same time because you're only talking about a small amount of people that, that were doing this. I, I don't know. I, I didn't enjoy the segment. Good. No, it was, it was not, not great. And it was a lot of time. And like, we built up for this for, for so long. And I'm not all that interested in seeing what the next step is here with the, all these people involved. Mm-hmm. Then we had big news footage of Shaq on the inside the NBA set last week, responding to Cody. And they announced that the match will take place March the 3rd on TNT. So it looks like, uh, they are forgoing any kind of interest of people paying to see Shaq wrestle and going for maximum eyeballs for the go-home show for the pay-per-view and probably will get a lot of promotion from TNT for this match. And I think that this is going to be kind of like their winter is coming, big promotion for a big match, and that's your time to do a big angle going into the pay-per-view that weekend. Like when you have the most amount of eyes on your product, make the most of it, and that's I think this is them shooting for what is the most amount of people we can get here with the novelty of Shaq wrestling and for free. I think it's a good move. I think it sends the message that, hey, we're not afraid to kind of like, you know, do these sort of celebrity angles, but we're not going to ask our audience to pay for what probably won't be a very good technically technical wrestling match. Uh, This is certainly more spectacle than, you know. Of uh, substantial, I think, in ring, you know, athleticism, and every they know that that doesn't mean AEW won't greatly benefit from it. I think just seeing a celebrity like Shaq on his show talking to his audience about wrestling and about AEW, it's it to me it already justifies all that they've invested into this program. Um, I thought Shaq was hilarious. Um, it sounds like the move he was describing, like it basically sounds like the Judas effect. So. I wonder if Jericho is going to have something to say about the Black Tornado. Eddie Kingston, Lance Archer, Lumberjack match. Um, I, I thought I thought they worked like a really great kind of brawling style match here. Uh, Butcher and the Blade, they yanked Archer to the floor early on. And then Archer went after Peter Avalon and missed running into the post. Kingston started attacking the Lumberjacks. And as everyone's on the floor, Archer uh, recovered in the ring and hit this huge tope onto everybody on the floor. Kingston takes over during the break. Bunny jumped on top of Archer and then was near was going to be hit with the blackout when Kingston saved her with the spinning back fist. Out of nowhere, completely out of context and played into nothing, Jake Roberts just murdered an helico on the floor. Like he just steamrolled this dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, listen, you get caught up in the action and 
Jake wanted to get some of it. Butcher then nails Archer as he's running the ropes and gets power slammed by Kingston. Blade comes in and sets up a table. And then Bear Bronson of Bear Country tackles him through the table. Interesting that they gave this guy that spot. Um, well, it seems they tried like to focus on Bear Country here, who have never been featured on Dynamite. Seems like this is the way of like bringing them up, their call up to Dynamite, so to speak. Uh, starting a new feud between them and uh, Butcher and the Blade. That's what I was just saying. I was like, they they need to introduce some new tag teams onto the show. This not, <laughs> not enough. Yeah, this Daniels and Kazarian storyline. I'm like, oh my god, how oh, many man. weeks in a row can we do this? It's what it's not stuff. An- Honestly, it's really one of those things where um, they'll introduce something on the show and then you won't really hear from them for months. And it's not, you know, they are wrestling. They're wrestling on dark. Um, but uh, I guess if, you know, if you're only watching Dynamite, you you won't be aware. I feel I'm entering this world on, on the wire that by the end of five seasons, I'll probably understand this, this thinking of so many different characters and such. Um, Archer then catches Kingston on the turnbuckle, stops, uh, stops him, goes for a choke slam. Kingston avoids it, but then Archer lifts him and hits the blackout and gets the win. It was a very chaotic match, but I, I thought like the brawling was was very strong for the time that it lasted. I think they did a good job of establishing like the danger of a lumberjack match early on. You know, it's not just supposed to be an excuse to crowd the ring with, like, bodies. Like, it's supposed to be brutal. You're supposed to get, like, you know, these mob beatdowns anytime you're outside of the ring. And I thought they had managed to establish that. Um, but I did feel like by the end it was almost too busy. Like, too many spots involving other people. And I don't think Archer and Kingston ever really managed to establish much of a flow towards the finish here. Um, like, overall, I've been disappointed by this feud. And I was kind of disappointed in the match. Well, I think by the end of it, it seemed like this was, it seems like this feud was just a pivot for Lance Archer, who looks like he's going to be in a higher babyface position on the show by the end of things. FTR did a video with Tully Blanchard. Tully goes over all of their problems. They accuse Jurassic Express of tattling to management like it's high school. And he goes over all the injustices. They had Tully banned during the tag title match. Then last week, they were handcuffed to a dinosaur. And now this week, they're kicked out of the Battle Royal. And Dax asks, what would bad men do? And they reveal Marco Stunt has been kidnapped. And he's tied up with a rope and and gagged here. And the announcers didn't seem all that concerned here. They just, oh dear, that's Marco. We've got our main event coming up next. Can't grieve uh, forever. N- no, no. Um, you know, there have been worse crimes, I feel, like announcers have ignored um, backstage. I mean, we've seen people get run over. We've seen dudes. Have people been shot? I'm sure JR is called, you know, a shooting or something. That's like impact. That. Right. Okay. Well, anyway. Uh, yeah, this is a new tactic for FTR. You know, abducting a child. Kidnapping, it's yeah. like them. Literally. Janela cut a promo uh, on Darby. They have a history of mangling themselves. The stakes are high next week. Joey Janela is back, and the future champion is going to be a bad, bad boy. I'm sure this is going to be nuts next week. Yeah, yeah. I think it's about time Darby Allen defended that title. I mean, how many? What is this? Is it like second he just, he or third? He just defended it against uh, Brian Cage. When? That was like two weeks ago. Oh, okay. Well, how many crazy, t- title defenses has he had? Um, that might have been the first. I'll defend it next week. Along along with that match, they announced Jericho and MJF against the Acclaimed, and Cody Rhodes and Lee Johnson against Peter Avalon and Cesar Bononi. And that's it. We have three matches, so I'm sure they will announce a lot over the course of the week. Mm-hmm. Not, a, not a stacked lineup next week. And the main event was Kenny Omega and the Good Brothers, accompanied by Don Callis against John Moxley, Pac, and Ray Phoenix. Callis came out with them, got into the ring, got the microphone, and proceeded to say, ladies and gentlemen, and they cut to commercial. We came back and he's on commentary. No idea what he said. Pac and Phoenix entered through Moxley's area. So the three of them all came through the uh, arena together. And this was a very entertaining match. Early on, Omega holds on to Pac on the buckle. And there's a kick from Gallows. And he takes advantage of Pac. 
and they explain the storyline reasons for all three baby faces to want to get their hands on Kenny Omega for various reasons. And finally, this match, they can do so. There was a magic killer that got stopped and Phoenix gets to tag. He did these incredible tandem spots with Pac. These two would be an awesome tag team together, uh, but we're very, we're very heavy on tag teams. But these two work together great. They hit these stereo moonsaults off the top to the floor. Then Phoenix did a moonsault into a backward roll to a cutter onto Kenny Omega in the ring. Phoenix then got seated on the top rope and Omega proceeded to hit a snap dragon from him off the top. There was a V-trigger to Pack. The one-winged angel gets stopped. And then Pack does a deadlift bridging German onto, uh, I believe it was Omega here for the two count. Omega and Moxley finally paired off. Everyone comes in. Phoenix hit his spinning hook kick and Tope Con Hero onto Gallows and Anderson. Then Omega hits his own paradigm shift onto Moxley. That was broken up by a 450 splash from Pac. And Moxley avoids the gun stun, hits his own gun stun to Anderson before he's taken out. Phoenix gets caught by a spine buster and they proceed to hit the magic killer with Omega taking out Pac with a V-trigger and Gallows pins Phoenix. A very busy match, but I thought this was awesome. A really, really fun sprint to close the show. And I think, as expected, Ray Phoenix stole this one. The man is just incredible in all of his movements. Just, uh, you know, even outshining Pac and Kenny, you know, two of the best right now. Uh, he, who, who all he, look good in this. I thought Carl looked, looked really good in this. But yeah, Phoenix was at quite a high level. Um throughout this match like this this was very tailor-made for phoenix and I, I thought this was a great match this was easily the high point of dynamite for me he really shines in these matches but uh you know it, it just i it makes you wonder like if he'll come out of this with really kind of any sort of lasting uh attention or if he's just going to be continued to kind of put into these spots to like you know amplify the quality of the match and then just kind of be forgotten about in story but uh, you know the main the main driver of everything is Mox versus Kenny, and of course the closing angle here. After the match, they continue the post match beatdown on the baby faces when Lance Archer runs out to attack Omega, Gallows, and Anderson, and Moxley is left in the ring, and in an angle that was written for waiting his biggest gripe, who attacked Moxley, and the masked attacker runs into the ring. And it's hold on, Ken. hold on. Do we do we know that this is the same attacker? Oh come on, the guy it was like uh, the myst- this guy had to be the mystery attacker. Wait, you think you, you could you could what? Just because he's a mast, it has to be the same guy from before. We didn't know the the previous guy was masked. I think this was a pretty satisfying hole being filled in. If they announce that it is the same guy, sure, fine. Okay, okay. I I feel they earned the benefit of the doubt with this. He attacks Moxley. It's Kenta, and he hits him with the go to sleep. They're mentioning the U.S. title match that's been announced for later this month on New Japan Strong. And that is how the show ends with Kenta. So it's a big moment, um, you know, for, for months now. I think the conversation has been the Forbidden Door and whether or not it extends beyond just AEW and Impact. We had the announcement of Moxley and Kenta for New Japan uh, for the U.S. title at some point. And this seemed to complete the circle. This was sort of like the last stumbling block between whether or not we, you know, had any sort of confirmation that all three of these companies and maybe more are working together. And it appears at least this week, the answer is yes. Kenta is coming in here. They're teasing some sort of, you know, uh, Excalibur. Excalibur's closing line in the show is, has the break in Bullet Club been fixed? Specifically mentioning the words Bullet Club. Kenta coming out here wearing a go to sleep shirt in the Bullet Club font. So it's it's a story of perhaps this isn't just a fake Bullet Club reunion after all. This may be truly a world reunion of the original Bullet Club members, the elite, and the current Jay White Bullet Club, which is just such a massive, 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 like, fan, kind of, like, satisfying, multiversal type of story that just is so exciting. What a great way to end the show. Yeah. I mean, e- before tonight's angle, like, that's where I thought that – that's your way out of the U.S. title match is Gallows and Anderson showing up there because we know they're going back once the travel restrictions are are able to be lifted, that there they can go 
give the assist to Kenta and leads to Kenta winning the title back. Uh, but then they did this angle tonight. Maybe that's uh, too obvious uh, of an idea to do. But I, I always like when you can do these kinds of angles, especially at the end of the show, where the viewer is left with, I want to see where this goes next. Like, what's going to happen? What does this mean? And you go off the air with that kind of, that intrigue, that cliffhanger that draws you back next week. So I thought this was a really strong end to the, to the show. So they did release a clip online after uh, Dynamite went off the air, and it was of uh, Kenny Omega approaching Kenta in the back as uh, Kenny proposed to Kenta a tag team match next week between him and Kenny taking on Lance Archer and John Moxley in a lights out unsanctioned match. So um, this is happening. Everybody. That's a big match to do yeah. the lights out gimmick in uh, next week. Mm-hmm. So that'll be the big match next week. So there you go. Yeah. A very strong end to uh, Dynamite as a whole. Uh, I, I didn't think this was a Dynamite that uh, hit it out of the park uh, for the totality of it. I think the strength of the show came in the last 20, 25 minutes. Uh, I got into the Lumberjack match. I like that. The wedding to me was a was a big miss. Um, Tag Team Battle Royal, it, it was fine. Uh, it didn't It didn't blow me away, but I think... Most of my praise would be reserved for the uh, the final 20 minutes or so of the show. Yeah, I wouldn't say this would be kind of like, you know, among the better Dynamites as a whole, especially like, you know, compared to some of their um, theme Dynamites, but um, with a really great closing angle that I think kind of leaves you with a very positive impression of the show overall. All right, well, let's go on over to the forum, and I'm sure lots of opinions on tonight's show. The poll... Gave this show, on a scale of 1 to 10, an 8.12. So pretty high high marks there. Do you want to start things off? Sure. Let's go to MJ, who says, a very satisfying episode of Dynamite. Why didn't Private Party come out at the end? It would have made more storylines since then Archer. Um, is the match they want to next week? Yeah, that's really it. How great is it that we have Mox, Pat Gallows, and Anderson getting a chance to have great multi-man matches after watching them have the same types of multi-man matches for years? It's really great. The women's t- tournament felt lit to steal a Braden phrase. The crowd erupting an impromptu, spontaneous sing-along with Miro is a top 10 moment I wish a full crowd was there for. AEW really needs to get Barkley on commentary for the Shaq match. Noah from Braun writes, Unbelievable show tonight. I love the tag team battle royal, just like the one from last year in Atlanta. The women's match was stellar, and I'm so excited for that 16 women eliminator tournament. The main event was one of my favorite six man tags I can remember. So much fast paced action, and the ending with Kenta appearing on Dynamite. Standing tall was spectacular to see. Really intrigued seeing all these doors opening for a up for movement between promotions. Nine out of 10 episode with Cody's big tag match happening on the go home show to Revolution. Where do you see him fitting in on the card for Revolution? Um, if there's not, uh, I mean, we have a a month until that pay-per-view it's like you could hotshot something to get him ready i can see i don't think it's a guarantee he wrestles on the pay-per-view if this is the, his big match that he's doing unless you uh kind of build to something either quick or you build two programs at once over the over the next month you could do either yeah yeah he might not but nothing's really in place as, as as of now it'd be pretty much starting something from scratch it would be, yeah. Uh, you know, ultimately, the project coming out of this entire feud, who it's benefiting, besides AEW as a whole, and I suppose Cody's name in the mainstream, uh, I think is really Jade Cargill. And now you have Red Velvet, who I think stands to really benefit it from benefit from it as well, of course. So maybe they'll break off into something for Revolution uh, with Cody kind of playing a, more of a supplementary role. But, it, you know, AEW is at the point now where Cody doesn't have to wrestle on every single pay-per-view. We get a Raymond from Sacramento who says, Tony Khan must love to shift the balance of power in wrestling. It's the second time in two months that he's done it. A dynamic show from start to finish instantly moves into the top tier of Dynamite episodes in their history. A 10 out of 10. John, John, if you had to guess, like, how far in advance do you feel like they would have worked something out with New Japan? Or, I mean... what? At least cause December. Because what I'm trying to think about is, like, Moxley did that angle with, with Kenta on Strong. And he specifically said, I'm going to make my way over to Tokyo to have the match. So did he not? Remember that that would have been shot back in December. And maybe they Mm -hmm. believed that it was, you know what? No, there, because apparently that match was taped. So it it could have just been a red herring for people to latch onto. Like they knew they were Mm -hmm. taping that match. So Tokyo was not going to be happening. 
So, I mean, yeah, I, I really would love to know, like, when all this kind of was, was set in stone. Like, you know, if we know, like, we've heard comments from Tony Khan saying how he's willing to work with New Japan, but they're not necessarily willing to let their guys come here. Well, now they are in the form of Kenta. Is this any sort of barter agreement that they might have with, like, with Moxley being able to now wrestle technically in the U.S. for this match so that they can have Kenta for their shows? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I wonder. It's 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 interesting to to know the behind the scenes. Uh, next up, we have Nick, who writes with Edge appearing on NXT. It felt like Dynamite needed an equally viral moment to leave a massive impression, and in walk Kenta. Following the breakdown of the women's tournament involving a Japanese bracket and wrestlers from Impact, NWA, and New Japan, all featured on tonight's broadcast, AEW has become an unprecedented collaborative pillar for the business we all love. Loved the rest of the show as well. The Good Brothers sold like hell for Phoenix. MJF teasing a hostile takeover of the inner circle. And I always enjoy someone popping out of a cake. All that was missing was Orange Cassidy telling Miro to put that beef away to bring things full circle. Mm -hmm. We got Andrew in St. John who says, I love the show. The women's match was great. And I'm very excited for some of the entrants in the upcoming tournament, including Benny, Maki Ito, and Mei Saruga. The wrestling wedding was great, totally fun, and I loved how Rusev was so suspicious of any hijinks, but not suspicious enough. I thought the main event really delivered in the star power they had on hand, and I loved how it all broke down at the end. Hollered for Kenta. I expected the feud to maybe just be a bottle program they taped all at once, but it feels like New Japan is going out of their way to make the match feel like a special event. And it made Dynamite feel like an electric must-see program. Nine glasses of champagne out of ten. Kate. About halfway through the show, I thought that the most surprising thing about it was going to be that the wedding segment was not as bad as I thought it would be. Still the low point, but I had braced myself for much worse. The show had all sorts of awesome moments in this show, even before that ending. Britt and Rosa was possibly the best women's match Dynamite has had, and the upcoming tournament looks exciting. I trust AEW to put together some good video packages to introduce Japanese wrestlers to an American audience. The main event was jaw-dropping. After this and their title match at Triple Mania, I'd love to see Phoenix challenging Kenny for the AEW championship. And goes on to say, The forbidden door has been opened, and for the first time, traffic is going in both directions. Congratulations to Tony Khan for making my head spin yet again. You also had Callis, like, taking credit for it you know at least in storyline so yes um so yeah he he i guess he'll try to like you know uh promote himself as sort of like the the orchestrator of this like pretty landmark deal uh jay from colorado says jade cargo looks fantastic that short vignette did more for her character than her last few appearances and i'm digging the logo AEW has been really good in the in the introduction vignette department they introduced wardlow the same way last year that short video made him look like something special. Now, if they could just do a real dark and disturbing one for Abaddon, I'd be happy. And the last one is Jake, who writes, 2020 was a pretty terrible year for the industry, all things considered. So personally, I think it's great that there's exciting stuff like Moxley and Kenta happening to get people buzzing about the product, whichever promotion you follow. All right. This graphic he has with um, Patrick and SpongeBob outside and Squidward looking through a window with like, Squidward being WWE and Impact, AEW, New Japan, and the NWA all just celebrating outside is really funny. And that's, yeah, think about that. In one year, like in, in the span of several months, I mean, that's who the field is playing um, in AEW right now. They've got, you know, kind of participants and wrestlers from all those companies. Yeah, I think that tonight, I think it left, it ended on a very high note, uh, Given just the potential that this represents, and I think that you let people's minds race to the possibilities that that entails uh, beyond this, like if, if both sides can make certain agreements and, and find a way to to continue this, it's it's strong for both companies. And I think that's been argued for a long time. But there you do go. You know, do you know what the announcement might be for uh, that New Japan might be making recently or uh, coming on? Or have you Which heard anything about it? Well, uh, I know Dave like tweeted something about in, in, uh, New Japan having some sort of big announcement around 10 a.m. tomorrow or today. Um, so speculation that, that speculation that it could be about a U.S. deal, but you know, makes me wonder. Well, they if, have uh, that TV deal that is still to be announced. That was the one yeah. like they announced would be coming. So if that's it, then well, yeah, and that's that's going to be graded upon what what level of broadcaster they're going to be on and how significant it is. It's like to me when you when you say TV deal, it's like that that could be great news. It it also could be you know small news as well. So makes me wonder really if they'll where. 
Yeah, it makes you wonder if they'll touch on what, you know, today as well. Like, you know, this AEW stuff. Well, you have to look as well. Like if New Japan is is debuting with a new TV deal um, that they're announcing for the UK and the US, is that if you want to make as big a splash as possible, it would behoove you to be able to get some exposure on on TNT. Like it, there's yeah. a benefit. And if AEW sees a value in it to promote a company that's on another broadcaster, then it can be valuable for both sides. Well, look at the buzz it's generating right now. I mean, just even working with Impact, I think, has, you know, at least greatly elevated um, interest in Kenny Omega and sort of their top programs. And doing something with New Japan is uh, even bigger than that. So I think it's, to me, a win-win for everybody. Well, it's always a win-win here at the post office. We are going to be back on Friday. We will have uh, two shows coming out Friday. I will be joined by Brandon Thurston of WrestleNomics. We're going to go through all of the WWE financials and their earnings call that's happening Thursday evening. And then Friday night, we're live here, 10, 15 Eastern, myself and Way with Rewind, a SmackDown. Yeah, and you guys uh, will be joined for, for all our callers, for all your Zoom calls. It's always a lot of fun. So join us then. And uh, yeah, Post Wrestling Cafe for all the bonus shows. And also... Uh, Shot in the Dark is out right now on the Up Next feed with John Ceno, uh, Deep Impact with Davey Portman and John Ceno from last night if you want to get caught up on Impact, uh, and basically postwrestling.com. We've got shows for 24 hours of your day. That's it, folks. Go check it all out, and we'll be back on Friday. Thanks for listening.